office in 2007 as its program director. She has a degree in law from the Bombay University and a postgraduate degree in management from Narsimonji Institute of Management Studies. Apart from streamlining the existing programs of Majlis around accessing justice, her main contribution has been to evolve Majlis's collaborations with the Department of Women and Child Development, Government of Maharashtra, in two important areas. First is Mohim, a cell for monitoring the implementation of the protection of women from domestic violence, and Rahat, a pilot project in Mumbai for providing support to survivors of sexual violence and bringing in systems for state accountability towards victims. Um, through Arjun. the course of this presentation, I am going to cover four main points through this um, uh, through this pre uh, research. Um, much, I work with Majlis Legal Center and for 22 years we uh, have been dealing with the issue of, ch of domestic violence. Um, we are a team of lawyers and social workers and we represent women in court. And in 2011 uh, is when Majlis started its program called Rahat. Um, Rahat has coordinated with state agencies to ensure effective implementation of both the POCSO Act and the Criminal Law Amendment and our modus operandi is victim support. So we, we, we provide victim support and through that ensure state accountability. Um, during the course of our work, we, um, we had the opportunity of interacting with almost 500 uh, victims of sexual violence since 2011. And what we did was to just get a sense of what was it before the intervention. We studied about 150 cases um, to see what 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 was happening on the ground? What 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 were state responses? What and we did that through judicial uh, orders, judgments of the sessions court. Um, so the presentation. Um, I think what this present the, the research findings for us were really shocking because um, there's a presumption of rape and who the victim is, who the accused is, where the crime happens, and uh, state responses based on these presumptions. So I think what the study has done is really to uh, change the discourse of uh, sexual violence and rape in the country. Um, As an initiative, what Rahat did was um, um, we decided that we needed to work with the system to make the system work. And uh, it, it, there was a whole lot of time where we criticized the system from the outside, but this was an opportunity to say, let's go in and let's see what can happen. Our strongest collaboration has been with the Mumbai police, and they were all too happy to have us in to say, come and do training, come and do training, because it was a new act and they just wanted training. And we said, we're very happy to do training because it's a new law and we're happy to train, but what is your commitment at the end of it? And uh, the condition we had with them and then the, the then co Joint Commissioner of Police, Mr. Date, was that we will do training, but having trained your officers, we will monitor the implementation on the ground. And how we will do that is through our victim support. So every time a victim tells us that this officer has done this, we would like to report that back to you and we would like to see a commitment from you of some action being taken. And I have to tell you that has worked brilliantly in terms of a rounded approach to making that change. Um, uh, we trained officers and after the training, whenever victims told us that this police station, this officer did this, we would write to the commissioner and we have 30 departmental inquiries uh, which the commissioner himself manages. And it's that message that has gone down and you can really see a change. There'll be a lot of NGOs who work with police today who will tell you that police do not refuse to record a case of, ch ch of sexual violence so easily today. And that's been because they've got a message very clearly that if they do, it gets reported and action is taken. And I think that is a very important learning for us of how to make that, that connection. Uh, this um, this visual is not very clear, but basically this was a poster put up at every police station. It's a pledge by the Mumbai police to ensure dignity of women and children at the police station. And through this pledge, what we try to do is do a pull effect. So when women come into the police station, it's in Marathi, it's at the entrance, and it tells you what your rights are. So even if the police is not sharing that with you, through this women can demand or NGOs can demand that police do this for them. Um, 
like I said, we train and we train and we train, but uh, we moved away from the traditional training of gender sensi sensitivity. We tried something new. We did what you call skill-based training, and the approach was that they have to do a task on the ground. They have to write a victim statement. They have to follow up a case. They have to file a charge sheet. They have to interact with court. What does it require? Because most often the person writing that victim statement never enters a court. So she, he or she doesn't know what the judge is saying about the investigation. So sharing that kind of information with them, go going through victim statements and showing them how badly drafted these victim statements are and how difficult it is for a judge to convict based on such a victim statement. And, and, and that really helped because for the first time we were addressing them as a skill based training and you could see the difference in what they were doing. Um, we drafted a lot of GRs. What we did was every time we spotted a problem on the ground, we, we pushed them and wrote them and we said, you need to send out this GR. Um, for example, they would take all victims to Nakbara police station and we said that's not not to be done. Sehat had shared with us the problems that Nakbara had and so you know, we did the GR and we said, you have to take them to the public hospitals nearby. But with that, we worked with the public hospitals and the police to say, what were the problems? Why were they not taking them there? And how could we resolve that? So a lot of end-to-end -end kind of holistic um, solutions to problems is what we tried to do. Um, we work with the judiciary, we are lawyers, so our intervention is retrieved from the time of investigation to the end of the trial. And working with judiciary means that they are the ultimate authority, nobody questions the judiciary. And so we thought it was very important uh, because rape trials, as you know, are in camera, so nobody is allowed. And not being allowed actually has a negative effect because then the lawyers and the public prosecutor and the judges can do what the hell they want. And for the first time as support persons, we entered the, the space and we started monitoring what the judiciary was doing while we were doing victim support. First year of POXO, we presented a report to the Chief Justice saying, this is what is going wrong. And at that meeting, we also informed him, it's really easy for us to go to the media and give this report. Because we had case numbers, we had things that the judiciary was doing inside the court to victims, making them wait, making them sit on a ledge for, for hours together. The victim and the accused were facing each other. And so we reported each and every of these instances and we said, do something. A year later, what we have is guidelines to the judiciary on functioning of special courts. I think that's a huge thing because usually when a law is written, the how does it unfold? How does it unpack on the ground? What does the judge need to do on the ground to actually make it happen is a little bit of a gap and this helped address that. So we have guidelines today uh, for the special courts. I think the biggest achievement of Rahat has been Manodharya. I cannot talk enough about this. Um, Rahat through, his ev through its evidence convinced the Department of Women and Child that conviction and acquittal is, is the need of the criminal justice system. It's doing nothing for the victim. Here is a victim who's marginalized, she's vulnerable, the rape has caused further marginalization. How are we going to rehabilitate and also financially contribute to her to ensure the rehabilitation? And with all the evidence and with all the campaigning, we, together with all a lot of you around here, have managed to get for Maharashtra Manodharya. It's a huge relief because it's about, it's not about the end of the trial. It's about the moment that happens. How can we contribute to her rehabilitation? And today, a victim of rape can get as much as three lakhs, uh, two lakhs to three lakhs uh, uh, as compensation. It's done through the district board and it's not about the end of the trial. It's about lodging the FIR. And this is paid to her. And then further to that, the Manodharya scheme talks about rehabilitation, which is still being worked out. But I think this is, is really something that we should rejoice and make it happen, make it work, keep monitoring how it's working. Um, so coming back to the report, so we studied and intervened, like I said, uh, in a lot of uh, cases. And I love this title because really uh, it is pursuing this thing called justice. What is that justice? And what does it mean to these victims who are, you know, who, whose whole life is about the marginalization they face? And in that, they are expected because that is the final outcome. This justice is the final outcome. And a lot of young girls who have never gone to school talk about this word and say, Didi, mujhe uh, insaf chahiye. 
and what it, what does it mean to different girls at different stages in their life and through this whole intervention process? This is a title uh, by an article of Farah Nakwi. She wrote it a decade ago, but I think it's so relevant to what we did, so we asked her permission to use it. Um, so the, the, the data that I'm going to share with you comes from, like I said, 644 cases. It's important to note that we tried studying previous, but a lot of our cases are 2013, 14, and 15. Um, I want you to notice the jump in cases of 2012, 231 reported cases to the Mumbai police. By 2013, it's 394, and in 2014, it's 610. Just keep mind of that statistic. Do you know what happened? Why this jump? Poxo happened and yeah, the criminal Nirbhaya happened, criminal law got amended, uh, things changed on the ground. Mandatory reporting came. Um, so a lot of people ask uh, us as much less, so are you women or are you children? And it's a tough question to answer because as domestic, as dealing with domestic violence, we're dealing with women and her children all the time. We don't say children, but that's what we do. But then we realized, and I'm sure a lot of us realized, that all the victims of rape that we deal with, most of them are children. Our first rape campaign where the women's movement starts is Mathura, who was a 16-year-old girl. And that's the start of the women's movement campaign on rape. So are we women or are we children? And I think this statistic really hits you really hard because it says something about what's happening in our country, in our city. 73% of rape victims are minors. They're under 18, they're vulnerable, and they are in, I mean, the kind of marginalization, the poverty, the physical abuse, the lack of nutrition, the, out, the outside schools, the kind of marginalization are so huge that really the rape is just like something low down within that structure. And these are these kids. And like Rahul rightly said, if we can't address this, then all your nutrition programs and your education programs are going nowhere. Um, and the most vulnerable, 50%, are between the age group of 11, 18, 11 and 8 to 18. And what it really says is it's also the age where girls are attaining puberty, their sexuality is questioned, uh, they are not trusted, they are not to be trusted, and constantly this allegation on them that um, They've had uh, relationships or they, it was consent and it's such a gray area for them because it's also the most vulnerable time of their lives. Um, so yes, we are women and we are children and uh, we look at it as, as, as a whole um, gamut. This is another very hard hitting st statistic which says that 9% of rapes are stranger rapes, 9%. And 91% are by known persons. 91%, somebody you know. And who is that known person is here. 18% are family. Family is people that she lives with. Families are people who live in her house. That's how family is categorized. And then you have acquaintance, which people live outside. So the uncle or, or somebody outside or the, or the locality boy or the person she works with or goes to school with, these are close acquaintances of hers. Uh, we have categories like promise of marriage, which a lot of people have a question when, when, when they discuss it. But who are these promise of marriage cases? Statistics say that about 90% of them are pregnant. Half of them are underage, half of them are above age, but they have been deserted. They have been promised marriage and then have been deserted. So when we talk about consent and, oh, she consented, but really, where is she today? Because she has little rights anywhere else. And so she goes to the police station and says, I want to marry him because my parents are not accepting me. And she's pregnant, has had multiple abortions, all because she wanted to be with this person. And then he deserts her. And how does that become consent? So that's a critical category and we shouldn't write it off so easily. And then you have 14% which is statutory rape. What is statutory rape? Age of, of consent moved from 16 to 18 with the new amendment and POXO. And what did it do? It criminalized consensual sexual relationships between people. 
And so when parents who are against this girl exploring her sexuality or it's about caste, it's about religion, it's about poverty, it's about so many things where they want to exercise their agency on this child, a case is filed. And so in that case, can you imagine the complainant, the victim is against the complainant and she then cannot be in the home because she wants to make that choice. So where does she go and her supposed lover is in jail? And so can you see how varied and how different and how complex this whole one word that we use, rape, and how these cases are so different? Um, I want to pause here, and this is the first point I want to address, is the link between domestic violence and sexual violence. Every second girl who's a victim of rape has a history of domestic violence, whether it's on her or on her mother. These are girls who are... Uh, uh, either the mother is a single mother, um, the mother is not there, um, the mother is facing severe domestic violence. Uh, the, a, every story, you dig, dig deeper beyond the rape and there is a history of domestic violence. Even the acquaintance rapes, she's vulnerable at home, she steps outside, she, she, you know, she makes those connections and there is where she gets raped. And so, you know, a lot of us uh, call ourselves child rights groups and we say, oh, domestic violence, that's not something we do. We don't want to do a session on domestic violence, but if we don't make this connection and if we don't join the dots, we're going to lose something very basic. This is the statistics of family rape. And, and just look at the numbers of fathers raping daughters. These are fathers and these are stepfathers. You know what was shocking is that 7.2% of total rape cases are by fathers. 9% of total rape cases are by strangers. Yet, our whole strategy and our whole focus is on what? Cameras in buses, street lights, toilets in homes so that victims don't face further marginalization when they go out and, and supposedly get raped there. And, and we are spending crores of rupees on this initiative and nobody wants to comment. You know, when I released the report on 1st August and we made a presentation, there was stunned silence. And then the commissioner of police had to speak. And he said, oh, really sad. And then he went on. The police are doing more bandobast in the dark areas and in the mills. And in, you know, because we get a Shakti mills and we project that as rape and we want to only address that. And I think it's important to set the tone here to see how are we addressing this other 91%. Uh, these are other statistics in terms of long-term abuse. And it's really important to, to state this year is 45% of abuse is long term. Place of offense, um, and, and then look at this, family. Most of the family rapes are long term abuse. And so it's not about one incident, it's not about an incident and then she'll come into the hospital and then there'll be evidence and then there'll be a trial. It doesn't happen like that. It's a grooming. I think in child sexual abuse you'll use this word grooming. It's a grooming of this young victim and then she is abused over multiple occasions and at some point with because of some turn of events or because of some support she manages to drop into the police station to register a complaint and so we need to keep this in mind of long-term abuse uh, both in terms of what evidence you will get in a rape trial and also what is happening in the homes home of course is the maximum number where rape happens so all our street lightings and our Everything else is just defeating this purpose. Uh, this is very interesting. Time lapse between incident and FIR. And though you know you have 20% uh, which says same day, 26% uh, says one in three, one to three days, and almost 19% says over over four days to 30 days. 30% 30 is above a month. But even this same day, when we try to dig deeper about victims who come the same day. Actually, these are long-term abuse. She has come into the police station and then they say that, when was the last incident? And she doesn't remember. The incident must have been a week before or 10 days before or a month before. And so she says, and police then just write that day. And so the same day is really not about same day. And the point I'm trying to make is our investment in high-tech forensic. Let's have the best forensic and let's do that so that we can convict rapists. You're getting no evidence. And that's the reality. Um, this I thought was really, 
you know, sad. If you see age of victim and outcome, the graph below. When victims are young, you have a 50-50% conviction acquittal. And as they get older, 6 to 10, still believable. But then you move on and look at 16 to 18. It just dips. It's like it, you, you are not to be believed. Can you imagine, this is a statistic, but just imagine what has happened to this victim at the police station, how did they treat her, what has happened at the medical, and what has happened in court. How, what kind of comments and what, ha what she had to go through, it resulted in an acquittal, but it broke her. It completely, I mean, she took a step to make a complaint, and she is double the vulnerable at the end of the trial. And that is really, really stark. So I think um, what we're trying to say at Rahat is the need of the R is a holistic support. And uh, it's a nice term to say holistic. A lot of people use it. But what does it really mean? Um, I just want to give you some examples of cases uh, uh, to, to explain what is holistic support. Um, I'll take two gang rape cases, one where Rahat intervened, one where we just uh, studied the case. Um, Kiran was a victim of gang rape. She was a daughter of a sex worker and her, her stepfather was sexually abusing her so she left the home. She left the home and then stayed with some people. She was working, she was out of school. At 8th standard she had dropped off so she was working in some catering, would come late night and she had a tiff with these locality boys because they passed some comments. The next day they came into this friend's place and asked that she be sent out. And they were, the, the family was threatened that if you don't send her out, we'll rape every woman in this house. So they immediately pushed her out. She was taken to the nearby shop and she was ra gang raped by five men. In all our 500 cases, for me, this is the most brutal case in terms of the, the kind of physical violence on her. Um, for two weeks, she tried to get her FIR registered. Nobody took it. At the end of two weeks, she managed to reach a shelter home and because, thank God, we have Asha Sadan in Mumbai as a shelter home who is the most wonderful shelter home for these girls, she insisted that the police record. Actually, it was she, she sent her for medical where they discovered it was gang rape and then the police recorded. And even then, this is a case where she was sent to Nakpara and so they only took the forensic and didn't bother about the scabs, the cigarette butt marks, the, the infection that she had, nothing. We interacted with the victim post this at Asha Sadan and we started providing support. And what was this support? It was small interventions. As an agency, Majlis has nothing to offer. We just can provide support. We can provide some legal guidance, but mostly support. So we tried our best to engage her into ensuring she gets other support services from other organizations. She was, of course, in Asha Sadan, which, which, which put her back in school. But then it was the trial. And these five accused were so confident, they asked for quashing of this case. Quash the case. I mean, this is something you do when you're so confident. And the judge, I mean, with our intervention, called this girl into her chamber and spoke to her. Being convinced about that, what happened, she denied the quashing. And at the end, uh, we, got an, we got a conviction. But what was the beauty of this conviction was there were five accused. That means there were five lawyers. In any other situation, Five accused lawyers questioning cross-examination would take I don't know how many days. Everything was done in one day. It is shocking. It's not done. It's not. I mean, anybody who goes to court will tell you this. And how we did that? Because there is a mention in our, in our law books which says the deletion that you cannot talk about victims' past sexual history. And if we took out all that, there was really no questions to ask. And so the judge kept hammering, saying, I will not allow past sexual arrest history. I will not allow it. And so we were able to complete all the five cross-examinations just on the incident. That was a huge relief for her because the stress of having to do this was double, I think, the offense of her having to go to court and do that. We got a conviction, but really it doesn't end there. It's about how do you ensure her rehabilitation step by step. At 18, Asha Sadan cannot keep her. Where does she go from there? Which is that home you will place her? Today, she's given her 12th standard exams. She's completed her 12th standard. She's doing a vocational course in making bags. And she's such a confident girl. And for me, that is holistic support. It's not about this little intervention that we do. Because we'll do the intervention where it's required. It may be medical. It may be police. It may be court. But finally, it's about her. She has to come out stronger. She has to come out above this and move on. And that is holistic support. 
you know in contrast there is another case gang rape again she was taken to the hospital immediately there was forensic evidence um there was everything in this case but there was no support and she turned hostile in court you know it just goes to show you that it's not about getting everything it's about being there for that victim and making helping her make the transition we have another case father raping daughter she took a stand she went to the police station police recorded the case at the end of it her mother because she actually deposed and against her father her mother threw her out of the house we got a conviction father went on appeal and got bail he's outside he's in the home she's outside and she's a bright girl when we met her she was studying at vjti doing her diploma she wanted to do her degree how will she find the funding to do this i mean that's the kind of support today she's doing her degree in engineering i mean she's not yet reached that point of being what you call a survivor she is still a victim till you make that transition it's very easy to use um words like survivor you know it's nice to use and it is important to use but what who is a survivor and when do you become a survivor you become a survivor when you survive just because you've been raped you're not a survivor when you survive and and overcome that that's when you're a survivor um we have another case which i really have to share with you which is really important to us which is the shakti mills case it's the second girl who we call the telephone operator she was there just to make the first case stronger to get death penalty that was the only only um role she had to play for the public prosecutor and for the police she was harassed throughout the trial because she had to be perfect at the end of it where is she we got a conviction city is happy we got death penalty we are all excited where is this victim i mean it has taken 3 years she was out of school she was she was again single mother out of school poverty and today you know with all that support she's back in school she is she's completed her 12th standard which 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 is about being a survivor and i just want to read to you uh what flavia wrote yesterday and i thought it was just perfect i wanted to in- introduce it in the slide but i couldn't but i'm going to read it to you it says transforming a victim into a survivor is a long drawn process it's not a matter of merely changing the vocabulary while keeping intact an oppressive system which constantly re-victimizes her causes her extreme trauma trauma and brings her down several notches in the social ladder from where she was prior to the abuse she becomes a survivor only when she emerges stronger for having walked through this intimidating system with someone extending a helping hand and in the process transforms the system itself rendering it more humane it is our hope that having responded to their needs we helped each of them to overcome their vulnerabilities and attain their goals and aspirations beyond their case the rahat team august 2015 rahat has evolved a five point program again very small font but just to tell you what we do is we cater to the needs of the individual it's not about bracketing it uh not about having a cookie cutter model saying all rape victims one stop help center we will sit here victims will come to us we will, it doesn't work i mean a lot of us who have tried it will tell you it's i, I think the single most important initiative that we do is we outreach we go to her place we sit in her kitchen we sit in her balcony and we speak to her and that's our contribution and that's being there for her because we know there are 5 lakh ngos in mumbai who can provide service it's about ensuring that linkage ensuring that she reaches it being there for her and i think that's the single most intervention that we do if you ask me um i want to share with you though conviction was never our goal our goal was victim support and state accountability what we got because of intervention because then the victim was confident she was deposing with confidence she was more secure in herself the court orientation visit really helps her to understand where am i coming to who is going to be my lawyer what will happen just to see that visually and we have managed to get the the, the state average is 28% our conviction rate is 68% and really that says something about what intervention can do and state can really learn uh, from this because finally they are only interested in conviction but even if you do this this is what it it will lead to um i don't know how much time i have but i think this is really um i have time yeah uh 
uh, like I said, each of these points are presentations in itself. But I think this is this is really important for all of us because I th I think this is a safe space. Actually, we released the rep report on first August, and I've had the opportunity to present at the IAS at the Hyderabad Police Academy. But this is my favorite audience because we are closest to victims, and we bring about that change. It's not them; they're, they're really quite distant from that reality. Uh, but this is this is a safe space, and I want to share this because I feel it's important. Everyone loves a good campaign, right? Uh, we demand, we ask, but then we actually get. And when we get, what do we do about it? What do we do with it? Because after the gains comes the hard work. It, it is about being at the police station. It is about being in that court. It's about being in the hospital and ensuring what we got is actually enforced, right? I want to take four examples. I have many. I've actually created a timeline of amendments that we got from 1983 to 2013. I'm going to share it with you all. I don't have it here. It's visually presented to say we got everything that we got in 2013 way back. What did we do with it is the question. 2009, victims of rape need not go to the police station. CRPC amendment. After that, so many judgments stating the same thing. Victims do not need to go to the police station. Victims of rape, you can depose, you, you can sit in a place that you are comfortable. How many of us actually ensure that is happening? We need to be there. We've got this. Now we believe that all the amendments came in 2013. It's not true. These amendments have been coming. And, and 19, 2009 was not even a campaign. Nobody heard of it. At the police academy, when I posed this question, nobody knows 2009 amendments. Nobody knows 2003 amendments. Because we don't use it. Because when we get, we don't know what to do with it. Another thing, past sexual history. Past sexual history was deleted in Indian Evidence Act in 2003. <clears throat> um, it says that you cannot talk about the past sexual history. Even if the doctor has, uh, has said that she has a past sexual history, you cannot use it because this is about that, this crime. And let's talk about this crime. But how many of us, we have to be there in court to enforce it. Every time the defense lawyer raises it, if the judge doesn't know, we have to enforce it. And it's hard work. But that's what's needed to be done if we want to be, make the system more humane. Um, this is very interesting because just the other day I got a, uh, I got a, a mail uh, which said that we are filing a PIL in the Supreme Court and the hearing is tomorrow and this section 376.2 has an exclusion which says rape on a wife um, uh, over 15 years, right? It says rape on a wife over 15 years is not rape. Basically the issue is marital rape. And there are people who are working on the campaign for marital rape. But I want to say that age of child got changed from 15 to 18 in 2009. And nobody is aware of this. Because the moment CRPC came, IPC should have been amended. And it, is, it should have at least said 18 years. And all of us, have I, I know, have spent, myself, have spent discussions on how can it be? This is a contradiction. What are we going to do? And POXO says this, but child marriage says this. But it was a simple step of ensuring law and judiciary amends it and says 18. Um, another one we have is Sakshi guidelines. It came in 2004. It talks about how to address child sexual offense in the court, how to ensure there's a screen. But nothing was being followed. Nothing. Because there was nobody to follow it, to ensure that it is being followed. The victim cannot know and nobody else cares. And then in March is mandatory reporting. And you know, it's sad, but every one of us in this room, I don't know about you, but I definitely have always said child sexual offense is not reported. It's just not reported. The victims are vulnerable. Nobody is reporting. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? 2012, POXO comes and mandatory reporting comes. And now all of us are looking at ourselves and saying, what are we going to do? We don't want a mandatory report. Victims don't want to report. How can you force us to report? But the law has come. So how are we going to deal with it? And I think the bigger question to ask is not victims don't want to depose. 
but it's to ask why do victims not want to depose and that's the critical question and why they don't want to depose while there is social stigma there is the fear of the system and the outcome of what is going to happen oh god so shushmita is making faces at me so i'm not going to go into mandatory reporting but i just want to tell you thanks to poxo which is such a brilliant act procedurally it is brilliant and then criminal law amendment came and copied poxo so again all of that got translated and today we have excellent procedures we have procedures that you don't take the victim to the police station in plain clothes woman police officer at a place where the victim is comfortable child welfare committees all that is in place and and maybe at a separate occasion like a workshop you can understand how these procedures confidentiality how many times will a victim have to interact with the system because my belief is nobody wants to live in a violent home nobody wants to live with violence sexual or otherwise and if they could access they would we just need to show them the way